There are many enigmatic giant ruins that can be found within Japan. Super megaliths so old, a number of the largest have eroded away to a state of unrecognition. An archaeological site which at the time of its life would have undoubtedly dwarfed nearly all other civilizations upon Earth. A civilization which far outstretches the modern urban sprawl of the Japanese coastlines. A lost super-civilization responsible for the construction of numerous pyramids found throughout the landscape, some of which are said to lay beneath several meters of Earth, which has slowly consumed them over the millennia. Amongst these curious ruins are extremely perplexing, apparently sliced megalithic stones, pyramidal capstones, and also, like many places dotted around the world, legends of giants. One of the many things Japanese culture has become renowned for over the centuries is their ability to create swords, steel weapons of a far superior quality than their rivals, giving them an edge over their foes for many centuries. One must wonder, where did this advanced knowledge of sword making come from? Was it mere ingenuity? Or descended knowledge left by a far more superior, entirely different, and far larger race of people? Many sword-making technologies, which even to this day, impress and perplex the many specialists who delve into the nature of this advanced metallurgy. Amongst these enigmatic and amazing swords is one in particular, one that for obvious reasons stands out from the rest. Known as the Norimitsu Odachi, at over 12 feet in length and weighing nearly 15 kilograms in weight, this sword was masterfully created over 2,000 years ago, with no other intention than to be used by a warrior of gigantic proportions. The Nadachi type of sword was one of the weapons of choice on the field of battle during the Namboko Cho period. During this era and far before, these swords were rarely created for decoration purposes. The price of their construction, the time and care needed in creating just one single sword, meant that most were indeed manufactured for the purpose of battle. Additionally, the cost of creating such an enormous sword would have been considerable. Was this enormous sword once used by an equally enormous warrior? Understandably, many have denied such explanations as a tangible possibility. Yet regardless, a satisfactory explanation for the creation of such an amazing object remains to be seen. Most people are aware of the crystal skulls, the best of which hidden away within the Smithsonian. Perfectly carved from solid pieces of crystal, their origins, purpose, or indeed possible function remain a mystery. What many are not aware of, however, is the astonishing archaeological discoveries which have recently been made in Spain. A remarkable set of crystal weapons found within megalithic tombs at a site known as Valencina de la Concepci. Archaeologists investigating the site have uncovered a vast array of crystal arrowheads, an exquisite crystal dagger blade, along with a number of other artifacts. Found within an enormous megalithic structure, constructed out of large slabs of slate, the resting place of at least 25 once clearly very important individuals, along with their extraordinary smorgasbord of grave goods. Included within the finds was another mystifying number of shrouds, claws made of tens of thousands of perforated amber beads. Just how they managed to fashion these mysterious crystal weapons remains unclear. A number of investigators have remarked that great skill must have been required to produce these unique rock crystal weapons. The rock crystal dagger blade, in particular, was found in the upper level of the structure. Its morphology is not unheard of in the Iberian Peninsula, although, however, all the samples recorded anywhere else were made from flint and not crystal. Furthermore, and perhaps even more intriguing, is the fact that the crystal is of unknown origins detailed and thorough analysis being unable to successfully pinpoint the original whereabouts of this magnificent crystal. Given the technical skill and difficulties involved in creating the objects from such a material, rather than simple flint, their purpose, and indeed manufacture, has been a tough thing for academia to explain. 
However, it is unlikely that any funded academic would presume, like we can, that these highly advanced, perfectly manufactured weapons could in fact be far earlier artifacts, created by a civilization with far greater capabilities than those of known prehistory. Supporting this hypothesis is that despite these objects being found relatively frequently within the burials of the 4th and 3rd millennia BC, crystal implements disappear from later funerary monuments within the early Bronze Age, a quote, truly striking development, researchers say, as it would seem the use of this raw material as grave goods was almost entirely abandoned, end quote. The reason for this remains a mystery. However, is it possible, as mentioned, that these were merely a discovered relic of a bygone era, thus making their availability limited? This would therefore make it appear as though there was a sudden halt in their mysterious and unexplained manufacture, while all the while, in reality, the manufacturing of these objects occurred at a different time in our history. In 1921, a Neanderthal skull was discovered, 60 feet below the ground within Rhodesia. Upon examination, it has since been realized that the skull has been pierced by a high-velocity projectile, such as a bullet, to the left temple. Analysis has since shown that this injury occurred at the time of death and could not have been a stray bullet years afterwards. If true, and the source of the hole was indeed a bullet-like projectile, the implications are clearly profound. For how could a skull dated at over 150,000 years old have suffered such an injury? Modern academia states that these remains must be impossible. Yet, according to author René Norbergen, a German forensic authority from Berlin, quote, the cranial damage to Rhodesian man's skull could not have been caused by anything but a bullet, end quote. The rounded entry point of the wound also testifies to the great speed at which the projectile would have been traveling at the time of impact. However, if the find remained unique, it would have been easy for certain fields of study to disregard its existence as a mere freak of nature, a result of pure coincidence. Yet thankfully, and most intriguingly, Rhodesian man is not the only prehistoric skull which has been found to have suffered this peculiarity. A few thousand miles away, along the Lena River in Russia, a skull belonging to an auroch was later found, an extinct species of wild cattle that lived from 2 million to 4,000 years ago. And just like the Cabway skull, aka Rhodesian man, the hole in the auroch skull is missing radial cracks, evidence that would have been left by a spear, arrow, or any other low-speed projectiles. Just how did these two beings meet their fate? Were they really shot by a firearm? If so, what type of firearm? Who had this capability 150,000 years ago? A time traveler? Or perhaps a hidden history here upon our planet? What do you think? Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more. The Ulfberts, a group of medieval swords found within Europe dating between the 9th and 11th centuries. The blade faces are inlaid with the inscription Ulfbert with a cross on either side. The word turns out to have been a Frankish personal name. It somehow has become the basis logo, a trademark of sorts, used by multiple bladesmiths for several centuries in their impressive attempts to make the hardest, most impressive swords of the era. About 100 to 170 Ulfbert swords are known to exist, yet the origins of the name remain somewhat of an enigma. However, we dare to postulate that the name may have originated with, with this sword in particular, a sword which these bladesmiths may have been attempting to replicate and indeed figure out how it was made. A Nova National Geographic documentary titled Secrets of the Viking Sword, which first aired in 2012 actually took a look at this enigmatic sword's metallurgical composition. The Ulfbert sword has almost no slag content within its composition, and it has a carbon content 
three times that of other metals of the time. Carbon found to be a great addition in strengthening steel, creating a metal known as crucible steel. A critical discovery, something which made England famous some 800 years after this sword's creation. In the process of forging iron, the ore must be heated to 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. This will bring the metal to a liquid molten state, allowing blacksmiths to reduce impurities called slag. However, Medieval technology did not allow iron to be heated to such a high temperature, thus the slag was removed by pounding it out, a far less effective method. Modern blacksmith Richard Furrer of Wisconsin spoke to Nova about the difficulties of making such a sword. Furrer is described in the documentary as one of the few people on the planet who has the skills needed to try to reproduce the Ulfbert by hand. To do it right, it is the most complicated thing I know how to make," he said. He commented on how the Ulfbert maker would have been regarded as possessing magical powers. To be able to make a weapon from dirt is a pretty powerful thing, he said. But to make a weapon at this time within history that could bend such without breaking, stay so sharp and weigh so little, would be regarded as supernatural. Furrer spent days of continuous, painstaking work forging a similar sword. He used medieval technology, although it required highly unconventional ways, never before suspected or documented. The tiniest flaw or mistake, turning the sword into a piece of scrap metal. He declared his success at the end as more relief than joy. Who was the maker of this sword? How did they know how to make it? The mystery surrounding this out-of-place artifact persists to this day.